factors that are for proliferation and differentiation. You have a signaling occurring, uh, and these signals kind of regulate the growth factor function. Are protein factors, they all work at a cell membrane level. So they stimulate the growth or proliferation of the cell by binding to a specific cell surface receptor, right? That's important in the cell. And provide cellular communication, they are mitogens, they enhance cell growth, and it's very central to the signaling pathway. So majority of the signaling pathways uh, have Receive their response. Um, they they respond to the growth factor action. In other words, growth factor is the essential thing. It has to bind to the receptor, transduce all the function, and then ultimately the cell is going to have a response. There are uh, several growth factors. The liver provide uh, has a uh, you know hepatocytic uh, growth factors. Majority of them come from the brain. Also, you have the uh, bone related factors. You have the um, uh, growth factors that are uh, <coughs> that are, are coming pituitary or hypothalamus. So hypothalamus pituitary are the main uh, main organ providing you growth factor, but there are other organs that also can provide uh, uh, generate growth factors. I call the progression factors. They are necessary to ensure that cell will enter S phase. And as we said, that growth factors are important only during the G phase. And once it reaches the restriction point, the growth factor function is over. So now you have two different regions. And then after this R, no GF is required. Or there is no GF function. So and again like here, it's a, you know, the way I've shown here is a quiescent or resting stage. And then you have progression factors and then you have the uh, no growth factor requirement. Now, I have to uh, take a step back because what happens is the entire growth factor function, uh, epidermal growth factor uh, is one of the main ones, or TGF alpha, they all have some connection with the oncogenes. And so we have to kind of review <coughs> our, uh, uh, you know, our approach to to learning of, uh, of viruses, just just a couple of slides, okay? So what happens is that the viruses would affect the proto-oncogenes to make oncogenes either, it can be mutations, or here we are talking about uh, just, the, just the viruses uh, right here. So what happens is that the uh, oncogenes then we know that affect the growth factors, will change the signaling cascade, and that will make uh, cell normal cells have normal cell proliferation, that will make a transformed cell, transformed cell proliferation will make cancer. So what these viruses are, and that's what I really want to kind of, you know, spend some time on, is, uh, and here we summarize saying that they are activated by a variety of mechanisms that encode growth factors and receptor kinases and other enzymes that participate in mitogenic signaling. But then if you look at it, the oncogenic viruses are, you keep your, Keep your mind clear that your viruses that we know as viruses are different than what we are going to talk about, talk about cancer. So in other words, there are very few viruses, hardly any really, that you can uh, put that in the human and it's going to cause cancer, right? Except that you have the HPV for cervical cancer or something like that, but, but there is there was a long time ago, there was a guy named Dan Moore in Washington State uh, University. And there was a, like a science paper, I, I think it was science, I may be wrong. But there are a couple of papers from his lab saying that the virus can induce or can cause uh, breast cancer and he had isolated viruses from the from milk. And uh, somehow that research has, you know, just did not, did not go forward too much for a variety of reasons which I don't know. But we didn't see too many papers after that. So viruses causing cancer is, is not as frequent. But viruses causing influenza, other diseases is quite common, right? And then you have retroviruses and you have DNA viruses and here we're talking about retroviruses. 
So you have the viruses that transform cells. If a virus integrates into a host cell genome, it will change its property and cell becomes transformed. Now what happens is, as I said that there are two kinds of viruses, you have DNA virus and you have a retrovirus which is a RNA virus and, uh, and, and this is just the definition of oncogenes that the protogenes altering its function uh, are, are, called the, uh, are called the oncogenes. Now this is important. What happens is whole concept came from Rao sarcoma virus. There's a huge uh, background on Rao sarcoma virus because that was causing causing tumors in the um, uh, in the uh, in the animals. So what they have is they have a sequence called SARC SRC. Now this SRC is a uh, is a is an envelope like there's an extra gene uh, which which causes which is required uh, which which is required in a virus by itself. It's a uh, it's a structural for a structural protein uh, thing, but this this RSV gene, which is SARC by itself, has not functioned. It's not required for viral replication. But many times, this extra gene is found found in the Rao sarcoma sequence. Okay, so remember the word is SARC. SARC was also found in many human tumors. So that's why the research on RSV or Rao sarcoma virus. Was, was really intensified and I will go into detail, it will become very clear why it's important. Uh, the uh, SARC protein is a self-phosphorylating protein. That is the only protein in the body that self-phosphorylates. Other proteins require, uh, you know, you require ATP or some sort of a phosphorylating uh, influence, whereas SARC is a self-phosphorylating protein. It is divided into three domains and then you have a, uh, a different action for different domains. The SH1 is a catalytic domain, whereas they, they are involved in the substrate uh, regulation of the catalytic activity. Okay. Now, if you look at that, just the names, so the Rao sarcoma virus, uh, you have the S, is called v -sarc, if it's in the virus and they are all in the VCs, the v, v meaning the virus, right? And they are all found in the, uh, in the tumors and then that is, is thrown out. So uh, the SARC, MIC, all those are, are not, you know, are not, not, uh, not really viral anymore once they are in the tumor. If you look at the growth factor signaling in a, in a bird eye view, then I wanted, I showed this slide for one or two reasons. One is, as I was studying, that all growth factors across the board, the function is a bottom line. Either you are going to have a apoptosis, you're going to have a migration, you're going to have growth, you're going to have cell, cell addition, or you're going to have a differentiation. So this, this, uh, um, this picture is also from, uh, from Weinberg book. Uh, but what happens is that you look at the, the three different, three main parameters. You have growth factors like TGF alpha, EGF. The difference between EGF and TGF alpha is that are very similar in nature, except there are some sequences in TGF alpha. So EGF by itself does not cause tumors, TGF alpha can. So TGF alpha is a carcinogenic, whereas EGF is not. Then you have all these different growth factors, neural uh, growth factors are there, several of them. They all bind to their own selective receptors. So these are the, this cartoon shows these as, as receptors. And then they are internalized and they internalized and turn on the signaling cascades of variety of different kinds, which in terms of going through either the, uh, you know, the PKC pathway, or it goes through the MAP kinases, or you go through the junk, junk pathway, and they all finally end up having some sort of a transcription uh, differences, which will make uh, uh, make the final product differences. So if you look at the sideline here, so we have the signal, these are all the signals, or called ligands. The, uh, these ligands are the, are the growth factors. You have the receptors, they bind to them. They have the adapter proteins which varies and they have to 
sort of uh, be regulated by binding itself and will go just like cell cycle you know we we know g1 s and g2 but then when you go into it this is uh, you know it's quite uh, quite complex the same way here the adapter proteins and enzyme functioning is 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 complex then you have a signaling cascade occurring and uh, then you have the transcription factors on the in the genome level inside the nuclei which in turn alters the uh, uh, the genomic profiling which causes either apoptosis cell division growth addition or cell differentiation now when you look at it the one thing we to keep in mind that once we identify a signaling process for any molecule then you know that if there are inhibitors available something that that you can stop then it will stop that process so for example if you have something uh, something required uh, just an example this is wrong i mean this is not i'm just taking it uh, as, as a hypothetical that if you if you find a inhibitor that would inhibit conversion of pi3k to akt right then whatever the akt function is later on going through the fos and and increasing cell proliferation will be blocked so if the cells if you have a cancer cell that are growing so effectively and it's following this process then you can you can find a cell block you can you can block you can do something that blocks that that step uh, of processing in a signaling and that should be your aim so in other words if you want to do a, a, a study on on say x compound x and you identify that it works through whatever pathway beta catenin or you know akt pkb whatever pathway that it works through you have identified a pathway you go through the literature find a inhibitor that inhibits a single process during that cascading event and see if that works to prevent or suppress the growth of your your cells in the and and then you can select that as your starting point for for writing your proposals or writing your grants and and you can come up with new ideas and submit it and then then you can go, go forward with 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 a in a big time research and make that as your aim and that's that's basically all of us did in the past or are doing that that that's exactly what you do sometimes you have no no uh, you don't have to identify cascade by, by yourself you know what it acts on so the, the signaling cascade is already known in the literature you pick a step you confirm a step that okay i have this expression occurring and the next expression occurring and there is over expression when i put my compound in or under expression suppression then you reverse it and see that okay if i find an inhibitor that's available in the literature or that you know of your own that you are working on you see if it blocks it and your cell inhibition is occurring at the end well that's all you need to know once you know that then you are home free then you have then that's a starting point for your you know next 10 years so that's that's how it works okay so let's uh, look at the organization of the egf receptor we won't work we won't do too much on this but it has a ecto domain like where the ligand is binding now when we showed that cartoon you look that as upside down okay then you will you will get a good relation see like for example here we did it like it went from top to bottom here you see then and and and, and, and turn it around turn this uh, th this gene around so you have egf receptor gene we have ecto domain where the ligand is going to bind then it's going to come down then your transmembrane is going to cross the membrane get inside the cell into the cytoplasm once you are in the cytoplasm then you have the c terminal end and that c terminal is end is going to have function the most important part to remember is that in egf receptor structure you have a uh, you have a sarc homology so there is a area in there which is identical to sarc now as we said in the previous slide that sarc is car carcinogenic that is responsible for causing cancers right so if you have in egf receptor your sarc that means it's prone to causing cancer 
that's that's the that's the uh, thing you have to remember. So the SARC, as I said, is a self phosphorylating protein, and uh, it's, a, it's a phosphoprotein. Means it self phosphorylates. That's the only phosphoprotein that can be phosphorylated. Or oh, there is nothing in the body that does that. And um, we talked about uh, you know tyrosine and serine phosphorylation. Tyrosine phosphorylation is for mitogenic signals, and serine phosphorylation is is for the CDKs and also TGF. TGF beta is the only growth factor that uses serine uh, phosphorylation and not tyrosine phosphorylation. All other growth factors use uh, use tyrosine uh, phosphorylations. <coughs> okay. Now the herb B. Herb B is is very important because what happens is that you have a uh, I'll talk about it. In a, uh, we have the uh, in breast cancer, we know about HER2 new uh, that's coming up, and the HERB HERB originally was present in the animals, in the rats, and then it was transcribed into the uh, or identified into the human. So if you look at the comparison between the EGF receptor and HERB, you have a lot of similarities in the uh, in its. Uh, uh, genomic pro uh, I mean the gene structuring so uh, all that's trying to say that EGF receptor RB and HER2 new they all have very similar uh, structural organizations and here it shows the sequencing we don't want to worry about that you have a sequences sequencing similarities in them so uh, the EGF receptor with uh, kinase activities, or if you look at the TGF alpha, I say the TGF alpha is the one that's uh, that's going to cause tumors. You have a EGF receptor family. You have a uh, cutoff is a FGF receptor or PDGF receptor. And if you look at these ones in the parentheses, those are the uh, those are the oncogenes that it really is uh, uh, trying to to work on. For example, these are all the oncogenic compounds, right? So, uh, so, so many growth factors, as I said, like uh, which are responsible or are considered to be responsible for having the carcinogenic activity. They all have their, their homologies with respected uh, viral component of, of oncogenes. Okay. So these are some of the growth factor comparisons that we have shown. They all have the same, similar, not same, similar layout. Uh, this is the tyrosine kinase domain, which is important, and that's how it's going to go in. The phosphorylation, some, some of them, like insulin-like growth factor, has, you know, as a duplex, as two, two gene thing. This, the CNGF, or they all have a different layout, but they all have similar uh, similar cascade of uh, of arrangement of all of their the structures so what happens is that some of the some of the growth factors they function uh, differently normally what happens is you have a growth factor that binds to the, uh, the growth factor is going to bind to the like uh, bind to the receptor here and your tyrosine kinase and is going to cascade all the function some of them is going to have, a, you know, the ligand dependent uh, firing. It means you have the uh, phosphorylations occurring with more and more growth factor, growth factor like component coming in. You have the phosphorylations occurring. If you have a mutation occurring in that, then what happens is that it does not require the ligand. So now you have a receptor that's sort of phosphorylating, and one of the reasons you you want the cell to do is that you have a growth factor receptor, growth factor binds to it, you have a cascade occurring by phosphorylation, having the tyrosine kinase activity. Now sometimes what happens is that there is a mutation and the growth factor receptor will, will um, auto fire. They will not require the growth factor and that's the abnormality that can cause cancer. So I'll show you the slide what you do with it. And this is just to show the uh, immunofluorescence. Now what happens is, this is you know, just a technique point of view. Uh, don't look into too much into the uh, 
uh, into the picture, but lot of confocal microscopy is used these days. And the confocal microscopy, what they do is they look at the merging. So they have a, uh, they have like a EGF and they have EGF receptor. They stain two different ones, two different sections. They try to merge, see if they are merging, meaning they are binding to that particular protein. Now, for known proteins and receptors, we know, but for the unknown, it's a really good technique. There are a lot of problems with confocal microscopy and over and, and, and the merging. Is many times you see backgrounds, and I'll talk about it if I have time, because I had a uh, I had a paper on that, uh, saying that what happens is that if you I had a protein and I had a receptor, and we merged it using confocal microscopy and it looked just like that. So that you have now yellow, you have green, you have red, you merge it, you look yellow. Then you do the uh, immunoprecipitation studies using biochemical techniques and it does not bind. So what that means is that what you always see in immuno using the uh, merging process is not always correct. And, and what I did is uh, I got a paper out of it, of course. I just wrote a paper saying that you cannot believe this all the time and then prove it. So, so when you, so as I was saying before, you always should depend on more than one technique if you can. If you have facilities and resources, try to do it for more than once because there are many things that you do in science, it looks great and then it just has so many false negatives that, that you have to pay for later on because when you go advance, it probably won't work and then you'll be frustrated that, well, I should have kept more attention in the beginning. Okay, and this is, I'm going to go show just the another, all receptors work differently. So as I told you, TGF beta is the only, uh, only growth factor or its receptor, TGF beta receptor that uses serine thyrothreonin uh, kinase domain and uh, they work separately. And all they do is, for example, if you look at EGF, the uh, two units phosphorylate by itself. In TGF, they phosphorylate the opposite one. So one, the, the tyrosine kinase domain is here, and it, it phosphorylates the other one. So there are some of, some differences in there, but you don't have to pay attention to that. That's just minor detail. So TGF beta, for example, as I said, that is a uh, it's a negative regulator. So if you look at the TGF beta, when it binds to the receptor, it enhances the, uh, uh, it blocks the cyclin DCDK uh, binding, which is going to inhibit, uh, inhibit the uh, inhibit cell cycle, inhibit the cell proliferation. So this is all growth factors, EGF, uh, you know, the PDGF, all others we talked about, they are all mitogenic. TGF beta is suppressor. TGF beta is not a mitogen, it's a it's an inhibitor. And TGF beta uses a different system. Okay. Now we talked about the receptor by itself. Now what is signal transduction? Signal transduction is a process by which by which cell converts an extracellular signal into response. Our final product is the response, right? So that this the response meaning is a cell to cell communication which is, you know, how it responds to the environment, what happens to the internal, uh, uh, you know, internal processes, that's all, uh, that all requires the signal transduction. It's all called signal, signal transduction. When you look at a single layout, you have a re signal, you have a receptor, you have a signaling cascade, and then your targets will become like metabolic enzymes, gene regulator, or cytoskeleton proteins, and the final product will be either altered metabolism, altered gene expression, or altered uh, cell uh, structural differences like the, uh, you know, laminin and fibronectin and things like that will be changed here. So those are the responses that uh, that we're talking about. Okay, the. Uh, there are there are many there are many uh, proteins that are involved in the process once the receptor uh, is bound to growth factor and after it's phosphorylated 
what happens is that there are there are many I, I can read this that's I'm looking in my things so right because the color so you the adapter protein so they're called adapter proteins right here grubs GRB2 this one is the adapter protein and then what happens is that it has to it has to go through the uh, go through the process many of the uh, protein kinase is involved uh, involved in the process it increases the uh, regulates the map kinases the map kinases get if you look at that several map kinases so this is called ma map kk before that there is map kkk like three k's and it gets uh, you know into the map kk by uh, phosphorylations uh, they become like kinases get phosphorylated then again it becomes this gets phosphorylated become map kinase and they get into the transcription factors and into the nucleus so how does that happen that this is a really important slide the the functioning of a ras for example here we are talking about ras so when ras is complexed with a gdp it's inactive and when the RAS complex with GTP, it is active. So the fun RAS functioning requires the engagement with GTP, which which allows the uh, phosphorylation of RAS for the downstream signaling. Now this happens by uh, there is a there is a thing called GEF or gonine nucleotide exchange factor, right? And uh, gap which will work here is called the GTP is activating protein. So this is a cycle which continuously goes on. So you have a RAS, inactive RAS, you have a stimulatory signal from GEF, G, from GDP comes off, it, GTP gets involved, this gets phosphorylated, then a phosphorylated one it goes up and makes RAS inactive, does the functions in between, GTP gets hydrolyzed and by using the the GAP. Now this one is the RAS activation on and off uh, function. You have a trigger that turns on RAS or that is a trigger that turns off RAS. And turning on and off is very important for the functioning of a RAS. So and, and then all oncogenes are going to work in this fashion. They may require different systems but the uh, RAS requires GAP yeah, which has a lot of uh, literature on it. Okay, so how can you determine the growth factor function? You have this your control where you have a growth factor and you have a phosphorylated catalytic active uh, uh, unit. You remember a cascade, you can generate an, a, a knockout mutant. So now you have a mutant that's a knockout, so the growth factor uh, activity is not occurring. So you look at the uh, uh, you look at the animal uh, that may have or cell that does not have a uh, growth factor uh, effect in that growth factor receptor knockout. Uh, in that you look at the activity of your compound whether it still works or it doesn't work, but you can identify the growth factor activity, or you can overexpress growth factor by uh, you know some mechanism the overexpression. Uh, we do overexpression by many different ways. You can uh, you can take a cell where you identified overexpression and you clone them, or you can have a compound that helps in overexpressing the uh, uh, growth factor response. So you 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 enhance the growth factor uh, uh, growth factor uh, overexpression, and you can study whether if you overexpress growth factor in the in the cell culture whether your response changes. You can block uh, growth factor receptor by using antibodies. So now your growth factor uh, effect is blocked because it, the signaling is not going to go through. So that's how you, you study the function. And also you can function, you can block the growth factor by a, uh, by a molecule that blocks the growth factor and that's a, that's a therapeutic approach where you identify a compound or a drug that's going to mask the growth factor and it, it can prevent its signaling so it does not, it does not do any, it does not do its job, right? So that all happens at the cell membrane level. The procedures that you need 
to study or you know western blot analysis which everybody does immunochemistry immunofluorescence using the fluorescing antibodies or the regular antibodies you use the siRNA uh, you look at the gene expression and you look at the real time PCRs uh, those are the procedures that you need to use I don't know whether um, whether you know in the labs here they I'm sure that you, know, you, you guys use the Western blot analysis. I don't know whether you use RT-PCRs or, or, you know, or the QRT-PCR, real-time PCRs and things like that. Uh, those are important for, you know, for many, many studies. Okay, this is one of the examples. Uh, for colon cancer studies, for the things that are colon cancer, this is beta-catenin is very important. So, there is a um, there is a protein called Wnt, and they have Wnt genes, and you know it's a protein. So people measure the Wnt gene mostly, and there are seven, eight different isoforms of Wnts. Uh, so in the absence of Wnt, uh, there is a called a freezered uh, protein here, and uh, there is another protein called the uh, dish uh, dishweld. Now, this complex here, the axine, APC, this GSK3 beta, and uh, that, that is phosphorylated GSK3 beta, and beta catenin, they bind, right? So when the complex is formed, and that triggers the degradation of beta catenin, okay, beta catenin gets degraded. Now, if you have a wind, wind binds to freezer protein, that phosphorylates freezer, it in terms activates the dish vessel, gets, gets also phosphorylated, that makes this GSK3 beta inactive, so its phosphorylation ability is gone. Now you have a beta catenin that cannot bind, that cannot work with the complex. So beta catenin comes off and that promotes cell proliferation. So in colon cancer studies, it's very important. And if we have time on the last day when I, I'll talk about how everything gets together, I brought in several different experiments together from my lab to show how everything works. And all these things that we have done in the lab, like we have done the winds and growth factors and you know, SIRNAs and just name it. So, so you know, as the time comes, what I'll show you is that everything that we are learning uh, a practical example. I'll go through about hour, hour and a half of couple of different compounds to see how all this comes together, all this this fits together. Okay, and this this slide shows the functional significance of various styles of receptors here, all the EGF receptor and the uh, uh, you know bunch of uh, viral uh, component or opposites of that one but not in viruses these are like derived from there or like that and these are the ligands this is what you see the over expressions and these are the types of tumors you get and this is again I got it from the Weinberg book if you can hold a Weinberg book it's just it's like a bible of uh, you know cancer biology book it's, it's the best written book and then if you look at the uh, signaling pathways, there are three different signaling pathways that that we put up here. And all three, I, the reason I put these three is, is not for any other reason, but people have used it a lot. So PI3K process, all three are regulated by RAS, but PI3K pathway goes through the AKT and, and PKB. PKB is like a protein kinase B, and then it goes through the uh, other some sort of growth factors here and it does the GSK3 beta stimulation so cell proliferation cell growth the mTOR pathways and uh, uh, bad B, uh, that says that's apoptotic uh, uh, inhibitor uh, which inhibits apoptosis so what happens is as I was telling you just a while back that you identify something that that your compound does. So, I had a PhD student uh, who finished uh, Akash. So he was he was looking at at one of the compounds called ProLX. Uh, it's a it's a therapeutic compound, and uh, looking at ProLX in and its effects on an aromatase inhibition. And um, what he found while doing it is that it was changing the mTOR 
signaling so he spent like uh, you know he had a habit of doing many things which was not good but he so he spent like 6 months doing amtor uh, amtor signaling well results came out good but what i'm trying to say is that you look at something what it does your cell line you grow with this and say you know he asked me says, can i do the amtor signaling as so you can try it out see if it works well at the end that didn't pan out i mean you know he, he was working on amtor and then he had to switch gear and start uh, start working on totally different different signaling pathways uh, yeah now he's uh, he's doing post talk in arizona so the the happens in many many, many different ways right? okay now this is the last topic within the growth factors that uh, that we talking about so if you look at that in in growth factor there are some not even in growth factor in general okay uh, we all know about gene expressions or gene regulation that you have a compound or you have a process where gene is expressed and then you have over expression of genes under expression of genes and the gene can do the protein and then you have a different response there are early, immediate early genes which are the genes which are uh, the the gene the final gene product or they are called delayed genes are regulated by early genes so this is very important for your studies if you guys are doing so like if you look at something within the first 10 15 18 hours of your studies not even that even earlier than that within like few hours after you start your cell culture the genes that are expressed or you see over expression of genes those are not the genes you're going to find a day later okay those genes are not going to show up so those are called the early immediate early genes and uh, you know and i did not know about this when we had you know in our lab and then somebody had showed that oh, okay did you know this and i said oh, this is really good because they'll come and show the data that okay if you do it for for 15 30 minutes you have burst of genes that are coming coming up and they're going away and the new genes come up so we thought that well there's some errors in the experiments why it's not coming we can see but then it's lost what's happening and these are called the immediate early genes and i'll show you what happens in them these are some of the immediate early genes i'm not going to go through that the list of it but then here is the process so when you have the um, so the delayed genes are the are are like really dependent on the early early genes so you have a growth factor receptor is firing you have the early gene synthesis once it goes through the cascade signaling cascade and you have the activated transcription factors you have immediate early genes now those messenger rna the immediate early genes are again going to make proteins and those proteins are going to serve as transcription factors for the subsequent genes and those are called delayed genes so like when we are doing cultures uh, or the studies after 3 days you incubate which is normal practice so, okay you are looking it after 3 days or after 2 days of your incubation to look at the gene expression it may it may be the original gene which may not require early gene in order for it to function or to come up but it's also likely that that may be a function or there is a earlier regulation before that which is a re- which is regulated by a new protein which is not your original protein but that protein is coming from the uh, from the um, uh, immediate early genes okay. and this is a road map i like this slide we're not going to go through that but this one is a good uh, good subway map he says so it's like a, it's like a train system so you have to you know you go to your end point by you know you just follow it up and go through change the change the train here and go there so uh, these are all regulatory that's what that keeps on getting changed every time like uh, people put in new in database and they come up with a new new system so this is a wind pathway for example we just talked about 
This is a TGA beta pathway and it goes through the SIN system. These are the, some other growth factors. These are cytokines. So if you look at the, you know, if you, if you go, for, if you follow it through, you will get a good picture. But uh, there is no sense in my, my reading off because it's, you know, all it is is a signaling of various molecules and various genes, uh, genes in the system. Okay. So now we're going to turn our attention and go from growth factor to cell apoptosis. How, when are we? I can keep on going, right? What's the stop time? You know, anybody? Hmm? Up to one. Okay, good. So in, we can we can do apoptosis now. Okay. Now we, you know, cell apoptosis, uh, which is. You know, the, um, uh, I, I did this slide before, but I will, will review it. But cell apoptosis, what we're going to talk about is the program cell death. And it is also a very complex subject. And if I do that, it, is, uh, it becomes very boring because they have the PARP cleavage. And PARP cleavage is so complex. So I won't go into that. I have slides. If somebody's interested, I can, you know. I can explain in detail, but uh, but I'll go over very very briefly over there. Okay, this we talked about uh, in last class. So the key characteristics uh, differences between normal and cancer cell is contact cell inhibition, which is really signature for uh, cancer cell. Normal cells know their limit when the cells grow. When it comes near the other cell, it stops piling over. There is a contact inhibition. Uh, whereas in cancer cell has a loss of contact inhibition. Okay, growth factor requirements. Normal cells require it. Cancer cells don't require it because that have a, as we talked about before. It will come back to you that you know it is self propagating. Anchorage dependence is present and anchorage dependent is absent. So what, what that means is that the, you know, the normal cells cannot pile up on itself, but the cancer cells can pile up and that's how it can form tumor. Then you have the cell cycle checkpoints. They are not really absent. It's, uh, these are, that's, a, that's a misnomer here, but all it is is abnormal. So cell cycle checkpoint controls are sort of lost. And karyotypic profile is normal or karyotypic profile is abnormal, which is also not true. It could be, but it doesn't have to be. The, the karyotypic profiling is still could have a 23 pairs of chromosomes and everything else, but and the chromosomes can look normal. They don't look like broken up or damaged or anything like that. So we won't call it abnormal. Now you can call it abnormal from the point of view that it has a different function. The function is lost, so it's abnormal. But structurally, they still are, you know, your 23 pairs. And proliferative life, this is important. We discussed about it yesterday, that proliferative lifespan of normal is finite and cancer cell is, uh, is indefinite. Now, yesterday we were discussing, uh, you know, about the normal cell, that CHO cells we were talking about, and then I was thinking about that also later on in, in, in my mind, some, something, something sticks in, then it doesn't go away, right? So, I remember that in, in literature, um, you know, and you can check it carefully, many, peop many people have referred to normal looking cells that are immortalized as near normal. There's a normal life. So if you write a grant application, make sure that you don't call it normal. Because I, I remember, uh, I, you know, I'm on the review committee of many, many uh, NCI committees, National Cancer Institute, and also in USDA and things like that. So in one of the times I remember that there was a, uh, there was a colon normal cell, somebody had made a big you know, think about it, and then there was a huge big discussion about whether you can call it normal. And it had come up that you can call it normal like. So that's the best word to use. You say normal slash norm like, normal like. So 
that means you you know that this is not normal but it has a norm it has maintained majority of the normal functions uh, it's not normal because it's uh, you know because it's, it's growing indefinitely it cannot be normal okay, okay there's another I saw something here it says normal cells fail to undergo apoptosis not true I've seen, uh, I've seen uh, cancer cells getting apoptotic signals. In other words, I can see uh, program cells. If you look at the, uh, if you look on the PCR and you look at the band profile, when you have a apoptosis occurring in the cell and you take a DNA and you load on your PCR, you will see this exactly known size fragments. You can see the bands, four or five bands. And Otherwise, you can see the lump either in the bottom or, or you can see the smear. So, <coughs> so if you look at a cancer cell and uh, you can see apoptosis and I give you an example. Say so you have a compound, right, and then you want to test it. Well, what cell line you test on? You test on MCF7, breast cancer cell lines, on HL60, on, on cancer cells, right? Well, something that you are testing your cancer preventive agents on a cancer cell line, that is not preventive, is it? It's really therapeutic because you're working on a cancer cell. You're not working on a normal cell. And then you look at a cancer cell, you treat with the drug, which you call it a cancer, and cancer prevention is close to my heart. I spent a lot of years but I also wrote a review on this. So, you know, I can take a claim. I, I, I said, said exactly the same thing, that cancer prevention, and I'll, I'll show you tomorrow, day after tomorrow, that cancer prevention, all the can the reason I had written this is because I wanted to make a case that I wanted to use a drug compound that we, uh, like, confirmed as a cancer preventive compound. I wanted to write a grant and call it a cancer therapeutic because I wanted to have make it therapeutic in into it. So I started writing saying that well since the all the effects of cancer preventive agents that we looked at were looked on cancer cells, which means it's a therapeutic agent because it inhibits the cancer cell growth. And something that inhibits a cancer cell growth is cancer therapeutic. So after qualifying that, if you start writing, now it's just like uh, when we were little, you know, you prepare prepare an essay on a cow, and the question <laughs> questions come on a farm. Well, okay, you know, you have a cow that uh, you know <laughs> goes in the uh, farm and eats the grass. You can change it to a cow or a grass, right? <laughs> and write the whole essay, and you still can uh, can get away with it. Same thing happens here. So, in a, I mean, in a, in, a, in a logical way, I'm talking about logical way. So, from an apoptosis point of view, most people, 95% of the, of the literature that that you will see, they have a cancer cell, they put a compound on it, therapeutic compound, they look at cell apoptosis, and they find apoptosis with variety of different methods. That means cancer cells apoptotize, right? That means there is apoptosis in cancer cells. So this is wrong. Okay, I, I, I took it from somebody's uh, thing. So, I mean this one here. So it doesn't fail to apoptosis. Fail to undergo apoptosis. Okay. So here we just kind of going to say that well, the cells, normal cells, they they live for a given period of time and then they die. That means the normal cells don't grow past few generations, they all die off. They have a signal to die. And that does through apoptosis. You have a cell apoptosis occurring, which means a program cell death. Now, we won't have time uh, because it's only, you know, we just have very limited time. So, which I spend a whole hour in my class is telomerases. 
so the telomeres are the you know they're the ending uh, they the telomeres at the end of the chromosomal thing so what happens is it's the aging thing when the telomeres start coming off and as you age the telomeres go away now in the cancers the telomer process is sometimes stopped and your telomeres don't become shorter and it remain cancers so that's that's another process another thing that goes on in the system and so what is apoptosis is a physiological cell death and it's called programmed cell death also it's a cell suicide cell deletion or a variety of different words that are used uh, <coughs> that uh, the uh, the how does the apoptosis kind of how do they come about the uh, major reasons of apoptosis to uh, occur is the aging of course No, the, the, the not having telomere, that means the cell's survival signal is maintained, right? Now, you don't really have, uh, not having telomeres or having telomeres short. That's what I'm saying. So, just to the, uh, res the response, they have the telomere shortening is, uh, you know, that, that's going to decrease, decrease your aging. But that's a normal process. So, what we are saying is, the telomerase shortening is not really the cause for tumors, right? That's that's a that's a event. That's a so that happens when the when the cancer happens. It's like you know correlation. But in case of aging, that's all together different. Uh, you know, it's, I mean, it's just like different things we are comparing. But uh, the correlation correlation is there. But it's like you know, it's a it's a it's a little bit. Uh, far reached in a little bit. Okay. So the apoptosis can occur by by number of different ways. You can remove the growth factor. I mean this is very simple. So what happens is that uh, <coughs> you can have the uh, stress factors. You can have something that like a dieting, something that reduces somehow the normal cell uh, deletion or growth or inhibition suppression that's all going to cause uh, programmed cell death the, this occurs in the embryonic and adult cells and uh, uh, proteins involved are always present in cell that uh, needs to be activated uh, that's obvious because you're going to see apoptosis where you're going to show the inactivation so you're removing the factor that activates the cell then you just remove it and you have the the suppression right now there is there is another word and we know that necrosis occurs in cancer cells you always have a necrosis occurring uh, and then you can see you know like when you look at the uh, center of a tumor you have a cell necrosis occurring and we'll be talking about it that has to do that also has to do, do with hypoxia and I'll be talking about that a little bit later but uh, the comparison, if you look at apoptosis and necrosis, the comparison, so the ap apoptosis is an actively regulated process. Cell death is due to injury or lack of oxygen or lack of some sort of a, uh, you know, some, some factors, and I'll be talking about it, like HIFs and things like that. So they have the uh, unregulated cell death to injury. Your DNA fragmentation occurring, so as I was telling you that you, when you do the PCR of DNA, you will see the bands of certain size on your PCR, you know, on your PCR. Whereas in case of cell necrosis, you will have the smear. It will have a big smear coming here. So you have the formation of fragmentation of nuclei or cell, cell shrinks. So like if you look at the, um, uh, if you look at the, uh, uh, cells undergoing apoptosis under the microscope, you will see the shrinkage. You can uh, you can also see, and I'll show you some pictures of apoptosis. So if you stain the cells with acrylene orange, and um, then uh, and then you look at the uh, you look at the cells under the scope, you will see different colors. 
so the uh, apoptotic cells will will show different color as compared to the dying cell then <coughs> you have the apoptotic bodies now apoptotic bodies i'll talk a little bit but not much because that you have the path cleavage occurring here and uh, uh, this the phagocyte phagocytic nature that's that's not within the scope of this uh, this class okay <coughs> and this is the same type of thing which is all you know you can look up i have this slide in your brochure and uh, there's a comparison between the two the uh, the major ones that we already talked about in in program cell death the morphological changes that we see in terms of uh, apoptosis or necrosis is cell volume is decreased in necrosis the cells swell <coughs> uh, the condensed chromatin is another feature that you see in apoptosis whereas the the, uh, the chromatin is fragmented here the mitochondria is uh, you have a really you know known structure of mitochondrial structure that that is normal here before it starts breaking down whereas here is aberrant and you can go through this these are all uh, you know there are certain genes there are specific genes uh, required for apoptosis there are there's no no certain genes required for necrosis and uh, the iron pump means the channel channel pumps are lost <coughs> <coughs> okay this is some of the pictures but this is not a really good picture so i'm going to talk okay so this is the experiment that uh, <coughs> that was done and it's in the literature so you you have a um, the uh, eggs right with the early cyst these eggs are uh, injected with the uh, with the early stage blastocysts have we talked about in the first class and so what happens is that if you look at the the genes the embryos that uh, that carry the transgene from this blastocystic uh, thing they will all they breed with each other some will care, cause cancer like for example um the transgenes so if you look at from the beginning you have a uh, cloned genes that are injected in here which are uh, in in case of you know all meek and bcl i was just trying to see what what genes they used my meek and bcl i didn't remember this slide for too long now so you have a genes that are involved injected you have single genes either c meek injected or bcl2 injected in this mouse the cells containing these genes and then you go over you have the carrying only one gene here and here you have the breed them you have both genes expressing in this one now you look at the tumor promoting profile or cell or the you know mice uh, surviving but uh, the one with bcl2 alone they survive longer and they make they they die and make with bcl2 they die okay so what is what what does the, all this mean what we trying to say is bcl2 is a survival gene and it used in most of the uh, uh, the studies that we do you use <coughs> you use the genes or the proteins that are involved with bats bad bcl2 bcl2 is a survival gene so when you put the animal <coughs> when you add the gene or transfect the animals with the the cells with the with the survival gene and then you transplant those cells into the animals that are carrying the survival gene the genes have a tendency to live longer i mean the animals live longer but if you put the oncogene in there which is going to uh, make the life span shorter they are going to die and when they have the two combined the meek is expressing more of its action than bcl2 and you have intermediate results that is all that factor show okay so there are types of uh, uh, apoptotic genes there are pro survival genes and there are pro apoptotic genes so you have bax and bh3 family bax is very popular and bcl2 is very popular and bad is very popular so if you are going to look at the uh, look at the studies we are going to measure some sort of expression of 
uh, of apoptotic genes or apoptotic proteins, you're going to select BCL2 expression, you're going to select BAX expression, and you're going to select BAD expression. And between the expressions of these three, uh, you can say, you know, how proficient these cells are undergoing apoptosis or the, uh, you know, how the cells are going to survive. Right? This is a layout, so we don't, we don't want to go into that. Okay. <coughs> so, uh, some of the slides here are things that I did not have in, in here. We'll skip this. Okay. So, now if you look at the summary of this, then you have probe apoptotic genes, which are, uh, which are involved in terms of uh, preventing apoptosis then you have a pro survival genes and this one is really you know used a lot in the literature now is bcl and the, what they do is they the function of the pro survival gene is to suppress the bax expression and bax is a pro apoptotic genes right and uh, and then the back so for example when the survival gene is uh, is uh, enhancing the expression of BAX because uh, uh, it's going to prevent the uh, the survival function of it. You're going to get the apoptosis, and then you have the pro-apoptotic genes which work on the uh, BCL12 cell. Uh, this is one of the examples that uh, this is from my lab. Uh, the work on dagulin. So this is a uh, MDAMB231 cells. Those cells are uh, uh, are called triple negative breast cancer cells, and uh, if you look at the effect of dagulin, this is a control, and this is a treatment with dagulin. So you have the apoptotic process uh, restored. Now the apoptotic, so that this uh, kind of gives the. I did not know, did not remember whether I had this slide in here, but what this shows is that the cancer cells. Um, you know, if you look at the normal cell, for example, and do a uh, do a control profiling like this, you won't see apoptosis like that. There's no apoptosis, or cancer cells don't have apoptosis like that. But the cancer cells do undergo apoptosis, uh, is shown by here. So when the apoptosis occurs, there are really known fragments. Otherwise. The control has everything on the top because it just does not it does it does not migrate. But if you have something that does not induce apoptosis, you will see a smear of DNA. You won't see a selective bands. So that's the process. That's that's a very easy process, and you use if you're going to show that that you no, know, you want to study apoptosis. Oh, I thought that I did not have this slide either. Okay. <coughs> So I wanted to show in this one is, remember I told you just two, three minutes ago that I'll show you a couple of days after, but I did not go through these slides before, or, you know, because I didn't think that I was going to talk about apoptosis today. So when you have a control, the, and if you, if you stain the cells with acrid in orange, okay, then you're going to see the control cells are going to look normal cells, growing cells are going to be showing green. You're going to have the yellow some guy did a PhD and said well exocarpal lactone looks good. So the exocarpal lactone uh, Julie studied for uh, for some time when she was undergraduate in my class, in my in my lab and she looked at the effect of uh, exocarpal lactone on, uh, on the cell apoptosis and you can see that when exocarpal actone was used at 5 micromolar, she was getting this effect, and uh, in uh, the same same effect, this, this would be, you know, five micro, is the same thing, different pictures, control cells, control cells, and the one with the exocarpal actone. So, and then she got a paper out of this also. Okay. So I think that I'm going to stop. Uh, because our apoptosis thing is done because if I get into the P53 it's going to be another uh, long time. If you have any questions I can answer. Yes.
sir, what is necroptosis? Is a new term necroptosis. Necroptosis. Necro. So I think it's a, it's, it's a fancy term by causing the, uh, the tumor cells are going to undergo necrosis, right? And the necrotic cells also may have a combination. The cells, the apoptotic cells, sometimes this kind of uh, nucleus chain can go away. Sometimes they do become uh, you know, necrotic by, by having the uh, lack of you know, the oxygen, the hypoxic condition, you have HIF, uh, you know, uh, no, not uh, not having any activity in there, and and, and sort of a combination of apoptosis necrosis. I believe I really have not come across a problem, but that's what I that's that would be my best guess. Okay, thanks, sir. Yes, Okay, so what we're going to do in the afternoon is uh, is the following. Um, we're going to show you short clips of uh, normal cancer cells. I have a short, uh, this short is real short, a couple of minutes videos uh, in there. I have one on, on epi, uh, epidemiology, and then we have one on cell regulation, the one I talked about, and one on signal. So we'll look about 10, 15 minutes of video, 10 minutes, and then we discuss that to see because this video is also not, you know, that's that's the one that that's not I generated. I'm just going to you know we're going to show, and so I'm new to them as much as we are. So we'll discuss that what is what is in there that that may be happening or not, and so that that will be our afternoon uh, afternoon session. For